Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering chapter 24 from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms textbook. This chapter deals with microbial symbioses with humans. So let's go ahead and get started. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. All right, let's dive right in. To chapter 24 looking at how microbes interact with humans now all sites on a human that contain microorganisms are part of what's known as the microbiome the microbiome is defined as a functional collection of different microbes in a particular environmental system so for example the human microbiome would be a functional collection of all the different microbes that live on the human body. And remember, the, these microbes, they don't live on any part of the human body. They tend to live on the surfaces of the human body, on the skin, in the mouth, in the intestines. Remember, the surfaces of your intestines are still considered outside of the human body. It's inside of your actual tissues that you should not find microbes, right? So inside of your blood, inside of your muscles, in, inside of your tissues, this is where we should not find any microorganisms. The microorganisms are on your surfaces. This includes all the different microhabitats uh, of your body. The microhabitats would, uh, would include the skin, would include the mouth, would include the colon or the small intestine, the large intestine, all of the surfaces that support different microbes. And by the way, scientists use the term microbiota to describe all the microbes on the body or in different microhabitats. And different microhabitats support different microbes. Remember, we talked about this before. The skin is a salty and dry and harsh environment. So unless you can grow in that environment, then the skin is not going to be your microhabitat uh, if you're a microorganism. For example, Staphylococcus is known to grow on the skin. And Staphylococcus is resistant to those dry, salty environments. It's, it's a halophile, right? It likes to grow in salt. So this is why you find Staphylococcus growing on the skin, whereas Streptococcus prefers the throat region in the, in the mouth, right? So different microorganisms are found in different microhabitats. This is also why you tend to get staph infections on the skin while you tend to get strep infections in the throat because these are the organisms that are in that region and looking to be opportunists to cause an infection if there's a break or a tear in the tissue. So in this chapter, we are going to be looking at the structure and function of a healthy adult human microbiome, looking at the whole adult microbiome, the GI microbiota, the oral cavity, urogenital tract, and the skin, looking at all the different microbes and where they live on these parts of the body. Now, here's an overview. There are approximately 10 to the 13 microbes, and if I'm remembering correctly, that's about 10 trillion microbes in the human microbiome. Uh, this is a large living complex community consisting of hundreds of different species of bacterium, uh, living on your body at any time. Here are just some of the microbial habitats on the human body, which are the site of ongoing studies. The skin, which is rich with different microbiota. The airways, the oral cavity, including the teeth and the gums. The gut, the entire GI tract, as well as the vagina. Now, what are some of the benefits of knowing the human microbiome and how it interacts with the body? 
Well, we can develop biomarkers for predicting predisposition to diseases that are caused by those types of organisms. We could design targeted therapies against those diseases. We could personalize drug therapies and probiotics based on your gene types, uh, based on your genetics. Uh, these are very early studies, however, but they do reveal that there are complex interactions between host and microbiota. Later in this chapter, we're going to be looking at how your gut microbiota can actually affect your weight, uh, which is a very interesting study. Now, keep in mind that some of these bacteria cannot be cultured, but we have ways of studying them. For example, we could sequence their genomes to understand their composition and their prevalence in the body. Here is just a list, a short list of different uh, human microbiome research programs and their, uh, their objectives, what, what their objectives are. Uh, notice how we are learning so much about how our microbiome affects our health and can cause disease. Some of these studies aim to answer basic questions about the human microbiome, for example, uh, such as do individuals share a core human microbiome? Is there a correlation between the composition of our microbiota colonizing a body site and a host genotype? So do our genes play a role in what microbes inhabit our body? Do differences in human microbiome correlate with differences in human health? So is there a correlation between different diseases or different uh, organisms on our body and how, how healthy our uh, GI tract is or our, or, or our oral health, etc., our skin health? Are differences in relative abundance of specific bacterial populations important to either health or disease? Very interesting questions, and like I said, we're still early on in our true understanding of these interactions. Now, keep in mind when we're now looking at the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract of micro microbiota, that humans are monogastric and omnivorous. Monogastric meaning we have a single stomach, not like a four-chambered stomach like uh, organisms like the, the cow, for instance, uh, we are monogastric, we got a single stomach, and we are omnivores. We eat a diverse diet of plant and animal matter. And this can affect our microbes, you know, the microbes that live in our gut. So the microbes in the gut affect early development, health, and predisposition to disease. And the colonization of the gut begins at birth. Remember that you are inoculated during the birthing process. During birth is when you pick up your first microbiota and those colonize you and become part of your microbiota throughout your life. The human GI tract, it consists of the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, and comprises 400 square meters of surface area. And remember, microbes can live on all of that surface area because that's technically the surface of your body. So you're going to find microbes all along the surface of your GI tract. And these microbes are responsible for digestion of food, absorption of nutrients, and production of nutrients by the indigenous microbial flora. Their gut contains 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 microbial cells. The gut is rich with microorganisms, a diverse array of different microbes living in the gut. Here you can see the GI tract and the major bacteria present on the left. You notice how different uh, groups of bacterium are prevalent along different parts of the GI tract. And that makes sense because think about it, there are different conditions along the path of the GI tract. The stomach, for instance, is highly acidic. So unless you are capable of living in an acidic environment, um, you're not going to thrive very well in the stomach region. 
Whereas the gut and the colon, the, the small intestine and large intestine, they have their own challenges. For example, this peristalsis effect that occurs in the, in the gut tube where there's this, this squeezing that occurs. You know, this, this squeezing can cause bacterium that aren't well adhered to the surfaces of the gut tube to break free and move along and be excreted in the fecal matter. So different parts of the gut tube have their own challenges and their own environmental conditions that bacteria need to overcome in order to thrive there and grow there. Now also notice this, the stomach would have the fewest microorganisms and that makes sense because you know it's so acidic. Then we have the, the small intestine where we have not many organisms, right? We have 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 cells per gram. And then we have 10 to the 8 cells per gram. But look at the large intestine. I want you to see that uh, because the pH is so low in the stomach and the pH is relatively low in the small intestine, um, the organisms are limited. However, if we look at the large intestine, which includes the colon as well, notice that the pH is more neutral and this accommodates huge numbers of these neutrophiles, these organisms that live in the colon. And this is where we have the vast majority of the microorganisms. Isn't that interesting? So pH can affect, pH can affect the number of microorganisms present in the microbiota of the gut. So let's talk just a little more about the stomach and the small intestine. Remember that there's a pH level of two, so the stomach and the duodenum of the small intestine are highly acidic, pH two, and this prevents many organisms from colonizing the GI tract. In fact, many organisms you ingest or go travel down the esophagus end up dying in the gastric juices. However, there is still a rich microbiome in the healthy gut. For instance, Formicutes, Bacterioides, and Actinobacteria are common in the gastric fluid, while Formicutes and Proteobacteria are common in the mucus layer of the stomach. And remember, Helicobacter pylori, which was discovered in the 1980s, has been, since been found in 50% of the world's population in the, in the gastric mucosa and is responsible for peptic ulcer disease, so for ulcers. Now, past the duodenum in the intestines, the intestinal microorganisms are responsible for carrying out a variety of essential metabolic reactions to produce all sorts of various compounds for you, including vitamins. The large intestine is essentially an in vivo fermentation vessel, uh, in vivo meaning inside of the body, and fermentation vessel, meaning there's low oxygen conditions in the large intestine. And so the organisms are undergoing fermentation instead of aerobic respiration. And these microbiota are using nutrients derived from your diet, from the food you, you're digesting that you've ingested. Most organisms are restricted to the lumen, so the inside lining of the large intestine, while others can exist in the mucosal layers. So here you can see this little picture of a, uh, a large intestine, and these are different micro environments in the large intestine. So here you've got food flowing from the small intestine through the large intestine and out towards the anus. This is known as the lumen of the gut. This is the inside of the tube. You've got the lumen of the gut. Then you have uh, the outer mucus layer and the inner mucus layer. And again, notice how some organisms exist in the mucosa of the gut lining, while other organisms exist in the actual lumen of the gut as well. Interestingly, the vast majority, upwards of 98% of all human gut phylotypes, this means phyla, taxonomic phyla, fall into three of these bacterial phyla, Formicutes, Bacterioides, and the Proteobacteria. 
individuals may have mostly formicides or they could have mostly bacterioides or a mix of the two. And this may regulate metabolism and the host's propensity for obesity. So studies have been done between formicides and bacterioides, and the, the studies show that the ratio of the two can influence obesity. I'm going to show you that study in just a minute, but here you can see a table of biochemical metabolic contributions of intestinal microorganisms. You see uh, vitamins are synthesized. Vitamins are synthesized by gut microorganisms. Amino acids are synthesized. Gases are produced. Various odorous substances are produced. Organic acids uh, are produced. Glycosylase, um, glycosidase, I should say, reactions occur and steroids are metabolized. A steroid metabolism occurs as well. All of these processes are being uh, uh, done by organisms that live in your gut. Now let's turn our attention to the oral cavity as well as our airways. The oral cavity, so your mouth, is a complex heterogeneous microbial habitat. Uh, the mouth obviously contains saliva and the saliva has antimicrobial enzymes in it that try to keep the number of bacteria at bay, but high concentrations of nutrients near surfaces in the mouth promote localized microbial growth. Just imagine how much food and sugar and fat you're eating. These microbes like to feed on that, and so you're going to invariably have microbial growth inside of the mouth. And a lot of this growth occurs on the tooth surfaces, on the enamel of the tooth. Now remember, a tooth has a mineral matrix known as the enamel surrounding living tissue, the dentin and the pulp. So here you can see that mineral matrix of the enamel. Underneath you have the softer dentin as well as the living pulp here. And microorganisms can grow on the enamel of the tooth. They can also make their way down into the gingiva, into the gums of the tooth, and all of this can become uh, infected uh, and cause uh, gum disease, gingivitis. Now, the microorganisms that thrive in the upper respiratory tract, uh, they can get into the nose, into the sinuses, Bacteria continually enter the upper respiratory tract from the air during breathing. Remember, there is dust and spores in the air, and you're constantly breathing in, and you can introduce microorganisms into the nose and the sinuses, into the upper respiratory tract. Most are trapped in the mucus of the nasal and oral passages and will be expelled with nasal secretions or swallowed and then killed in the acidity of the stomach. The lower respiratory tract, on the other hand, uh, this includes your lungs, has no normal microbiota in healthy adults. Why? Because a ciliated mucosal layer, known as the mucociliary blanket, will move particles up and out to the uh, out of the lungs. So here, let me make a let let me make it clear here. This is known as your upper respiratory tract. It uh, spans from the sinuses down to the larynx, including the nose and sinuses. All of this is known as your upper respiratory tract, and you, you have several microorganisms in the upper respiratory tract. It's unavoidable. Just the process of breathing introduces microorganisms into the upper respiratory tract, but a lot of them, like I said, are secreted through nasal secretions or can be kind of go back here and, and get introduced into the esophagus and ingested into the stomach, into the stomach for uh, destruction by the acidity, the gastric juices of the stomach. Now, there's many microorganisms in the upper respiratory tract, but in a healthy adult, you should not find many organisms, or if any, in the lower respiratory tract, because even if inhaled, even if microorganisms make it to the lungs, 
the lungs have specialized mucociliary blankets that push or push those organisms back up, back through the lung, through the trachea, and then down through the esophagus for destruction by the stomach. Isn't that neat? So the the lower respiratory tract uh, should be relatively free of microorganisms due to the expulsion of microorganisms by the mucociliary blanket, as well as coughing can expel microorganisms from the lungs. You don't want microorganisms to linger in the lungs because that can result in pneumonia and an infection of the lungs. Now, let's turn our attention to the urogenital tract. The urethra and the bladder are germ-free due to the conditions there and the constant flushing that occurs during urination. However, Escherichia coli and Proteus mirabilis are able to sometimes make their way into the urethra and cause disease, cause a UTI infection, a urinary tract infection. These uh, UTI infections are much more common in women, and this is due to the proximity between the rectum or I should say the anus and the urethra in females versus males. The other aspect of the urogenital tract, the vagina in females is weakly acidic due to uh, the presence of lactobacillus acidophilus, a resident microorganism of the vagina which ferments the glycogen. Uh, by the way, glycogen is present in large amounts in this region. The, these lactobacillus ferment the glycogen and produce lactic acid. Lactic acid, therefore, makes the acidic environment of the region. Moving on to the skin. The skin is rich with microbes, about approximately a million resident uh, bacteria per square centimeter of skin for a total of about 10 to the 10 skin microorganisms covering the average adult. Remember that the skin surface varies greatly in chemical composition and moisture content. Some people have sweatier, are sweatier. Some people have drier skin than others. Some are some have oilier skin than others, and this can impact the types of organisms that grow on the skin. Now, the normal skin microbiota uh, has a, consists of four major predominant phyla, those phyla being the gram-negative proteobacteria, the gram-negative bacterioides, and then the gram-positive bacteria, the Formicides and the Actinobacteria as well. These made up most of the microorganisms on the skin. Now again, what can influence the skin microbes? The environmental factors uh, can, can influence this weather. So is it a dry climate? Is it a moist climate? Your... Uh, the, the factors of the host, including your age, whether or not you are undergoing puberty, your personal hygiene, all of these can influence the microbes that are present and the numbers of microbes present on the skin. All right, let's delve into how we obtain our microbiome after birth and how we study the microbiome as well. Remember, in humans, we study the microbiome. One popular human microbiome study was known as the Human Microbiome Project, which surveyed hundreds of medical students to look at the baseline for healthy human microbiomes. Another typical way we study microbiomes is known as uh, the mouse model. We use these germ-free mice, completely germ-free mice, and study the impact of the microbes on the health of the mouse. And the cool part of using germ-free mice, by the way, germ-free mice meaning we can, we, we, we've learned how to grow mice in a lab setting 
that are completely sterile, that are completely germ-free. Um, even their kibble is germ-free and the water they drink is germ-free. So they have zero bacterium in their guts. And then we can introduce different bacterium and see how these different bacterium play a role in their health. It's really interesting stuff. Now, keep in mind that mice, although it's a great model of organisms, uh, a great model organism. They have a larger cecum than humans, and a lot of the fermentation is done in the cecum rather than the large uh, intestine, as in humans. Here you can see a juxtaposition of the mouse gut on the left and the human gut on the right, and you can see the more predominant cecum of the of the mouse versus the human. But other than that, the mouse is a great model organism. We can use it as well as that germ-free environment in order to study the impact of antibiotics. Uh, we could look at dietary conditions and with strict dietary control. We could look at the impact of fecal transplant techniques. And we can see what that germ-free environment, uh, how it affects the, my, the, the, the growth of the mice and and how how uh, introducing different organisms can affect the mouse health. Keep in mind that you are colonized at birth. Remember the fetus in the womb of the mother is relatively germ free, but during the birthing process, this is when there's a transfer of the microbiota from the mother to the infant. And vaginally born infants have a microbiome that is more similar to their mothers than, bo than those born at C-section. That's very interesting. Also, breastfeeding can play a role. Breastfeeding infants have more commensal bacteria um, than non-breastfeeding uh, infants. Now, as you age, you've, you've got the, the, the microorganisms become established in the gut. Uh, but during aging, right, as you, as you age older and you become more frail, this is associated with a decreased diversity of microbiome. Now, what are some disorders that are attributed to human microbiome? What are some of these gut disorders, oral disorders, skin disorders, uh, vaginal microbiota as well? Let's start with a disorder of the gut inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. This is a chronic inflammation of the gut and disruption of homeostasis known as dysbiosis. Uh, antibiotic use can increase the risk of developing IBD, but once developed, IBD may be transmission, transmissible between family members. Now, in, individuals with IBD have a lower gut microbiome diversity. You can see that here. Here we have plotted individuals on the y-axis and gene number in the thousands on the x-axis. Think about gene number as the larger the gene number, the more diverse the microbial population. So in healthy people, in healthy people, you have a huge gene number. You have a large amount of genes that make up the gut microbiome, and this is this is linked with a healthy gut. Having more diverse organisms in the gut is linked to better gut health. However, people with IBD, patients with IBD exhibit a lower gene number. This is indicative of a lower diversity of gut bacterium and gives you the propensity to develop IBD. What about the gut microbiota in obesity? This is, this is a really interesting study, and I wanted to share it with you. It's an obesity study done with microbiota in mouse models. Normal mice have 40% more fat than germ-free mice. Isn't that interesting? Remember the germ-free mice I told you about? Those germ-free, completely germ-free mice... They live just fine. You know, they live in their little cages and they don't necessarily need the gut microbes to live, but they tend to be much lighter, uh, much more lean than their normal mice counterparts. 
So because of this, it was hypothesized that your gut microbes somehow give you more nutrition out of your meal. Uh, they give you more um, uh, uh, sugars and fats. They provide more sugars and fats from your diet than do uh, germ-free mice who don't have these microbes to help provide that extra nutrition from your diet. So when germ-free mice were given normal mouse microbiota, they started gaining weight. Isn't that interesting? If you have a germ-free mouse, it's relatively lean. But when you give that mouse microbiota from a normal mouse, even on the same exact diet, they start gaining weight. This suggested that your gut microbes help to extract more nutrients from your food that you can use to store as fat. Mice are genetically, mice that are genetically obese have different microbiota than normal mice. Isn't this interesting? So you're, you've got the normal mouse microbiota and that varies from the obese mouse microbiota. And what they noticed was that obese mice tend to have more firmicutes of the phylum, the, the gram-positive phylum firmicutes. Here you can see on the left a lean mouse, and this represents the gut microbiome of the lean mouse. Notice that the lean mouse has larger amounts of bacterioidetes than it does firmicutes. Formicutes being the blue rods and the bacterioidetes being the red rods. Um, in an obese mouse on the right, notice that these mice have larger numbers of formicutes. And so how does this work? Let's go into this real quick. When you ingest food, that food is fermented. This fermentation provides volatile fatty acids and nutrients for the host. Uh, the host can use these uh, nutrients. However, during fermentation, hydrogen gas is also produced. And hydrogen, hydrogen gas can feed back and slow fermentation, thereby limiting the amount of fatty acids and nutrients for the host. Uh, now look at the obese mouse on the other hand. Look at the right on the obese mouse. This mouse has larger number of formicutes, and this is also concurrent with larger numbers of these green dots. You see, this is methanogens. Obese mice, not only do they have higher concentrations of formicutes, but they have higher numbers of methanogens as well. So how does that affect the obese mouse? In this case, you ingest food, or the mouse ingests food, there's fermentation that occurs in the gut. This produces volatile fatty acids and nutrients, which the host, you know, the mouse can absorb for fat storage. Now, remember, normally this also produces high levels of hydrogen gas, which can then turn off fermentation. Okay. However, the methanogens that are present, these methanogens, are actually converting that hydrogen gas to methane, okay? And this lessens the number of, uh, the amount of hydrogen gas, so we cannot shut off fermentation. So there's, there's a limited feedback regulation, there's a limited feedback limitation of fermentation, thereby you're, you're producing more volatile fatty acids, you are producing more nutrients for the host. So this mouse, is gaining much more nutrients and volatile fatty acids from its diet uh, to its lean counterpart, even when they eat the same diet. Isn't that interesting? And it goes on. Let me show you. It goes on. <clears throat> like the mouse model, obese humans have more formicutes than non-obese humans. So they took that mouse study they translated it to humans, and they see that it still holds true in humans as well. The nature and transferability of gut microbiota is dependent on diet as well as genetics. Look at this. Uh, look at this study. It's very, very interesting twin study. These two individuals, there's an, these are twins, genetic twins. 
they studied an obese twin and a lean twin. And again, obese twin possess more formicutes uh, and methanogens than the lean twin. When the gut microbiota, the, the microbiota from the gut was transplanted from an obese human twin to a germ-free mouse, this mouse became obese. So just by introducing gut microbes from an obese twin to a germ-free lean mouse, the mouse became obese. Isn't that interesting? And the, the lean twin, who had fewer formicutes in the gut, these microbiota, when transferred to a germ-free lean mouse, did not promote obesity, did not promote weight gain. Isn't that interesting? It's a fascinating study. Now, before we move on to the next part here, dental caries, so cavities and periodontitis, which is uh, gingivitis and gum disease. Before we move on to this part of the chapter, let's take a quick break time with our little helpers, Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's carry on. Here we're talking about mouth uh, or oral uh, microbiota and some of the diseases that could be caused by them. Remember, in the mouth, you have streptococcus, which can attach to the tooth enamel and cause dental caries, also known as cavities, uh, as well as it can get into the gums and cause periodontitis, also known as gingivitis, you know, gum disease. Cells form a biofilm called a dental plaque, which has streptococcus and other fermenting bacteria. Remember, it's mainly streptococcus mutans that's able to attach to the tooth surface. In fact, here you can see some of these streptococcus and other bacterium colonizing the tooth surface. And once there, they produce this plaque uh, through quorum sensing. And at that point, these fermenters produce acid, right? They're producing lactic acid, other types of acids. And those acids are wearing down the tooth enamel, causing cavities to form on the tooth. And if you don't brush your teeth, this plaque goes from a soft, gooey substance to harder calcified tartar, which is almost impossible to remove with a toothbrush. This is why you need those uh, yearly or twice yearly uh, dental clear cleanings. Now, if the bacterium get down into the gums, this can cause periodontal disease. Uh, this is also known as gingivitis. And once, the, once in the gums, the bacterium can go systemic. The bacterium can get into the blood and go to other, or, uh, other organs. They can cause cardiovascular disease. They can even cause arthritis. So it can become quite a problem when the bacterium spreads uh, from the mouth to other organs. Now, what about the gut microbiome? Again, we're looking at the gut and the diseases of the gut. <clears throat> oral, when you take oral antibiotics let's say you have a infection on your in your arm and you want to take oral antibiotics to help with that infection in your arm realize that anytime you take oral antibiotics you decrease all of microbes in the gut as well so you're not just targeting the ba the bad bacteria in your in your infected arm but you're targeting all the bacteria in your gut. You're killing tons of microbes in your gut anytime you take antibiotics for any reason. So both target bacterium and non-target bacterium die when you take oral antibiotics. 
and the use of antibiotics during the first few months of life is particularly bad because it, it's, it increases your risk of developing IBD, irritable bowel, as well as other disorders of the gut uh, related to dysbiosis. Now, if you take antibiotics, uh, again, what do you do? You kill off your gut microbes, and this can open up real estate in the gut lumen for this nefarious player, Clostridium difficile, also known as C. diff for short. This is a endospore-forming antibiotic-resistant bacterium, right? Yeah, it's, it's quite a tough little guy, but it also... Uh, once once you're infected with this bacterium in the gut, and once this bacterium has taken over and colonized the gut, it produces toxins that irritate the colon and can cause colitis and you know blood to form uh, and bloody stools and such and a lot of pain and discomfort. So Clostridium difficile infections are associated with antibiotic use. Uh, Clostridium, remember Clostridium is a genus of spore formers that are generally antibiotic resistant. And unfortunately, because Clostridium difficile is antibiotic resistant, if you come down with the C. diff infection after, uh, you know, having some antibiotic treatment, um, it's, you know, relatively difficult to treat, right? It's, you can't just take more antibiotics to clear a C. diff infection, usually you need a newer type of therapy known as a fecal transplant, where healthy fecal matter is transplanted via enema, you know, or nowadays they have other means in order to uh, treat the Clostridium difficile infection. Here you can see that in a normal healthy colon, uh, you have a large number of microbes, a large bacterial diversity in a, in a normal gut. However, when antibiotics are introduced, your diversity drops. The number of microbes in the gut drops because so many microbes are becoming killed, especially the more susceptible, drug-susceptible microbes are dying off and sloughing off of the gut lumen and the gut uh, mucosa. Now, this allows for the nefarious, the green line represents um, Clostridium difficile, this, this allows for the nefarious Clostridium difficile to take up shop, to take up that empty real estate and colonize the gut. And as it does, it irritates the colon, it causes colitis, which is inflammation and bleeding of the colon, and this can cause disease, right? The disease that's... Uh, accompanies C. diff. And remember, the best way to cure this disease is to undergo a fecal transplant. Fecal transplant introduces uh, a large diversity of microbes from a donor, a healthy donor, and those can displace the, the C. diff bacterium. Now, moving on to another topic here, which has to do with gut health, probiotics and prebiotics, and what these terms mean. They don't mean the same thing. Probiotics are living organisms that confer a health benefit to the host. Think of healthy gut bacterium. These include many species of bifidiobacterium and lactobacillus. You can find these uh, beneficial bacterium, these probiotics, in uh, many uh, foods and drinks, such as yogurt and different probiotic drinks. Here you can see some of these products that uh, and foods and supplements that contain probiotic bacterium. So when you think of probiotics, think of healthy gut bacterium that you can ingest uh, through common foods. And the way they work is by taking up space or nutrients and limiting the ability of pathogens such as C. diff to colonize the gut. So imagine they're taking up space in the gut and they're occluding and they're crowding out the more nefarious pathogens of the gut. So they're doing you a favor. 
Prebiotics, on the other hand, are not organisms, but they are typically carbohydrates, sugars that are indigestible by human hosts, but provide nutrition for fermentative, healthy gut bacteria. So think of these as sugars that you can't necessarily digest, but are easily digested by healthy gut bacterium that helps promote their growth. All right, and with that, that leads us to the end of chapter 24. It was an interesting, interesting chapter. Uh, so let's wrap that chapter up and head off to our next video covering chapter 25. I'll see you there. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.